If you're a writer or a game master watching this to get some inspiration for your storytelling, here's something else you might find useful. Campfire Blaze, a browser-based set of writing tools that keep your creative work tidy and easily accessible. It offers a word processor, maps, timelines, character sheets, and encyclopedia-style pages to keep track of your magic systems, languages, items, and other world-building elements. It keeps everything neatly organized together instead of dealing with a bunch of spreadsheets and random scribble notes. You can collaborate with friends and co-writers online and either keep everything separate or selectively share your stories. You can try out the free version of Campfire and then buy modules to add exactly the features you need. Or you can unlock everything with a monthly subscription. And during the October open beta, it's entirely free. So give it a try through the link in the video description. All right, let's talk about armor. Well-made plate armor, especially at the height of its development in the 15th and 16th century, is highly protective, quite oppressively so. When properly designed, the rounded surface makes blows glance off or bounce off and thereby not transmit most of the force to the target. Armor tests reflect that, pun intended. So on one of my helmet test videos, Somebody asked a question, which I've seen a few times, how did people even die if armor was this protective? Which is a perfectly reasonable question. So let's delve into it a little bit. I'm gonna give you a few examples, not going overly into detail on each one, just a broader approach and also so this doesn't turn into a two hour video. Well-made plate armor is virtually impervious to sword blades, but not so much other weapons, which can hit a lot harder. Maces, war hammers, pole arms, lances also in particular. If you think about a lance on horseback at full charge, there's enormous force in that because it has the weight of both the rider and the horse behind it. So that can potentially pierce plates if it's a direct hit that doesn't glance off. So in my helmet test videos, which by the way, if you haven't seen them, link down below in the video description, it was pretty difficult to damage the sturdiest helmets, even with uh, maces and warhammers. Of course, strength is a factor. The stronger you hit, the more damage you're gonna do. You also have to keep in mind, historically, they weren't of uniform thickness, generally. Nowadays, they're made of a sheet of steel that is all the same thickness, whereas in historical times, typically, the, they would be different thicknesses depending on how much protection you need. For example, the front of the helmet tended to be thicker than the sides. The thinner gauge helmets were a lot easier to destroy, at least with direct hits that didn't glance. And the helmets are generally quite good at that. Even the human skull, if you think about it, due to its spherical shape, it quite effectively redirects impact and can make it glance rather than taking it head on and absorbing it all. Also important to note that even if the helmet itself looks unscathed, the wearer underneath might not be because there's still a lot of force being absorbed by the neck, for example, and also the brain itself. Uh, if you think about it, a, a person being hit in the head experiences a lot of rotational force that will whip the head around. And this is what can cause damage to brain tissue by overstretching it, that's actually also what causes concussions. And if you think of uh, reinforced fencing masks used in HEMA sparring, even though they have a shock absorbing liner and additional padding, it can still be pretty painful to receive a powerful blow to the head and concussions in HEMA tournaments are not uncommon. So the neck could break or receive whiplash, there could be brain hemorrhaging, etc. even with a good helmet. So looking at specific cases in history, like for example, the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, where the invading English and Welsh army under King Henry V was exhausted and outnumbered, people usually point to the English longbowmen as the decisive factor, which is one of the factors. So the barrage of arrows that the French knights would have, to, would have had to endure how likely was that actually to kill them? There've been a number of testing videos of arrows versus breastplates. Uh, Mike Lodes has done that, for example, Todd's Workshop, Lindy Beige, and others. So you see the effect of a longbow on various types of armor. I've also done crossbow tests against a breastplate. And generally, they're not as effective as you think. The points punch into the plate, but don't really get far beyond that. So don't actually get through the 
padded layer underneath the plate. But even if the breastplates offered a lot of protection against arrows, not everything did to the same degree. For one, you have gaps in the armor, generally under the armpits. For example, the neck, uh, the inside of the elbow, the groin, uh, etc. Those are places where you can't put rigid plates because then you wouldn't be able to move properly. Like for example, you need to be able to move the, the arm like this inward. And if you just have plates here, then you're stuck. Uh, there are some more advanced suits that actually have segmented plates covering those gaps, but those are exceptional. And if I remember correctly, the ones I saw were made for kings, so it wouldn't be available to just anyone. And uh, for example, also the inside of the gauntlet would just be covered by leather. You wouldn't have rigid plates there because then you would be able to hold on to things. So a large volume of arrows flying at you could randomly find those gaps in the armor. Like also uh, the visor, of course, you need like a slit or other opening to see through. And the historical sources mention that too. For example, Enguerrand de Monstrelet says, the French stoop to prevent the arrows hitting them on the visors of their helmets. So clearly that was a concern. And the Gesta Henrique Quinti mentions that arrows pierced the visors and the sides of the helmets. But even if as a knight you were lucky enough to be uninjured by the arrows that hit you, they would still hinder you for the following melee. If you have a bunch of arrows sticking out of your armor and your shield in particular, Todd made a video about that recently where he showed how difficult it is to cut off arrow shafts that stick out of your shield. And of course, also if they penetrate through the shield, they can hinder you. And those hits may also deform plates and restrict movement, which is also part of the idea behind a Warhammer or a mace, even if the blunt impact to the armor doesn't directly injure the user. It would dent it and it would make it a lot more difficult to move in it. And uh, the ideal anyway during a warfare at that time was to capture knights because they were worth a lot. You could ransom them. So it would actually be desirable to incapacitate them rather than kill them. Uh, commoners were not so lucky. They were much more disposable and were much more likely to die on, in a battle. Also, if you think of the horses that the French knights rode on, they would be less armored. So if the horse is taken down and falls during, in, in the middle of a full gallop, you can imagine how dangerous that would be for the, the rider to be thrown off and maybe collide with other riders and horses, maybe horses fall on them. Imagine the chaos of a multiple traffic accident just with armored knights. Just wouldn't be a good time to say the least. Also, enemy weapons are not the only thing threatening you in full armor. You know, the Battle of Agincourt took place on muddy ground. How muddy varies by source, apparently. But either way, the French knights were eager to rush in because they saw that the English were outnumbered and not in good shape. So they were, of course, eager to prove themselves in battle and take prisoners for ransom. So some of them would get stuck in mud and then the troops behind them were pushing hard against them, might have trampled them, pushed them down and prevented them from, from getting back up. And then also you have to consider the issue of bodies piling up as the fighting intensifies. So if knights in the first row fall down, even if they aren't mortally wounded, but if, if they just fall down from just the heavy impact of a pole arm against their armor, for example, and then somebody else falls on top of them, they can't get back up. They just have more and more weight piling up on them pressing down on the armor. Maybe the armor is even deformed and makes it harder to breathe to begin with. With all that weight on you, you would just suffocate. Another example of similar problems is the Battle of Hemingstead in 1500, where a peasant militia and Dithmarschen in northern Germany defended against a mercenary army sent by the Dukes Frederick I of Denmark and John of Denmark. The defenders were familiar with the area and opened up dikes to flood the land, and then they used poles to vault between the ditches and be more mobile than the invaders who lost more than half their army and the majority of casualties came from drowning in their armor. Sometimes they had highly effective armor but just weren't covered everywhere. For example, if we look at the Battle of Towton in 1461. This book, by the way, is about a mass grave found at Towton. Would highly recommend that if you want to look at the archaeological evidence. 
of injuries. I'll link it down below. In this battle, the majority of combatants were common infantrymen rather than knights. So the typical equipment was a salad or salet, a jack of plates or brigandine, and a buckler. Shirts of mail were not uncommon either, but there was limited or no leg armor or gauntlets. And the research in this book shows that the head was a prime target. 27 out of 28 skulls had showed signs of battle injuries, mainly from sharp weapons. Uh, the hands and arms were also heavily targeted, which makes sense if you consider that this would be furthest forward as you're attacking and defending yourself, even if you make sure with good technique to lead with the blade as opposed to the arm. The arm is still further forward than the torso. Speaking of which, in this mass grave, there was no skeletal evidence of attacks to the torso. Now that could be due to soft tissue damage that's not visible on the rib cage or what seems more likely to me is that it was just good armor that kept them safe or that just made the attackers not go for the torso in the first place because they saw that it was well armored. So even if combatants had highly protective armor, they might not have been covered the same way everywhere. Maybe they had a, an open face helmet. So the face in and of itself is a target or maybe they, the arms were not as well armored as the torso or the neck was exposed, etc. Armor could also endanger them in other ways, aside from the danger of drowning. Heat exhaustion was a problem during the Crusades, for example, and dehydration. And outside of battlefields, armor dueling is a different form of combat. The manuscripts show plenty of strategies and techniques for dealing with the limits of armor, exploiting gaps. You see thrusts aimed at the armpits, where the most protection you could expect would be male. And uh, Fiore is very nonchalant about this. He shows simply lifting up the visor to stab the guy in the face. Uh, he also shows pushing on the elbow to basically turn your opponent around and grappling. And he says, let's see how well the armor protects you when being attacked from the back. He's just that sassy. He shows strikes to the face with a guard and pommel as well. Of course, you have the infamous murder stroke where you use the sword as an improvised pole arm to batter the helmet and cause enough damage to the armor to restrict movement. You also see sneaky shenanigans like a thrust into the gauntlet through the open cuff and many grappling techniques. Some that allow you to break joints inside the armor and uh, immobilize the opponent, wrestle the opponent to the ground, then draw a dagger and threaten them with it. One picture shows uh, basically pulling the helmet off enough to expose the neck and thrusting the dagger into the neck or thrusting a dagger or sword blade through the eye opening. There's a number of ways to bypass armor. Overall, it's of course a lot harder to fight an armored opponent because the armor removes openings. It restricts what potential targets you have to attack, but it doesn't make the wearer invincible by any means. There are ways around it. So, Hope you found it interesting. Hope that answered the question. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks.